Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Worship at Donaldson CP Church this morning. It's good to see all of you here in the sanctuary, and uh, welcome to everybody worshiping with us on Facebook this morning. Uh, I thought this week I would be that guy and just ask everybody if it's hot enough for you. So is it, is it hot enough for you? Uh, last week, this week, the next week, all the weeks, all the days, it seems like this is never going to end. So we thank God for air conditioning here in the sanctuary. We uh, thank you to David Atkins who got the uh, made the phone calls necessary and got the air conditioning working in the fellowship house again this week. So that was out. Um, if you ever needed a reason to hate ants, uh, the ants on our property love the air conditioning unit for the fellowship house. So uh, there you go. They keep getting between the switches and the contacts and whatever else and shorting that out. But uh, thank you to uh, David Atkins and uh, Bill Faulkner of Goodlettsville Heating and Air for getting that fixed and uh, making Sunday School in the Fellowship House a little more pleasant this morning. So uh, we do appreciate all the things that happen through the week here at the church that we don't always see and don't always know about. Uh, if you want to turn on the back of your bulletin, we do have just a couple of announcements, things that are coming up. Of course, uh, prayer time here Thursday, 1215 in the Sanctuary Building uh, during the lunch hour. And if you are wondering, I do generally remember to come over, turn the air conditioning a little bit cooler so it's not quite so hot while we have prayer time here in the sanctuary. Uh, uh, if you want to join me here for that, uh, the door is open from 1215 to about 1245. And also next Friday, this coming Friday, not next Friday, this coming Friday, the 29th, Saturday the 30th, and then Sunday the 31st, we have our vacation Bible school. So if you are part of that, if you have kids, if you have neighbors, somebody that would like to come or you think needs to come, please let them know. They can Register through Facebook online. Uh, that is still up. And then Friday at 5.30, if you need to bring your kids, if you need to, uh, if you're volunteering, if you're working vacation for Vacation Bible School, uh, 5.30 we'll have pizza, and then the Vacation Bible School part is from 6 to 8. And Terry, do we need a head count for that, for how many are coming for pizza, or will we just have lots of pizza? All right, so... If you can let Michelle know through the week that you are planning to come for pizza, uh, she can get a head count and we can order enough pizza, but not too much pizza. Uh, make sure nobody's hung, uh, nobody goes home hungry, and then make sure we're not sending 75 pizzas home with people. For Although if you need lunch for the following week, like, that's fine too. Uh, but let Michelle know. And so pizza at 5.30 on Friday, vacation Bible school from 6 to 8. Uh, Saturday, vacation Bible school from 6 to 8. And then ice cream following Vacation Bible School Saturday evening. And then on Sunday, Vacation Bible School continues. We will have our normal worship service. Um, we will sing our Vacation Bible School songs for, for worship. Uh, but we'll have our normal worship format and, and everything else, with, as well as our uh, delayed uh, Father's Day sermon, since we were not here for Father's Day in June. And those are all the announcements. Oh, and then after church, about one. One-ish, the water slide. So our annual water slide next Sunday uh, for at 1 o'clock down the lawn. Uh, pray for rain, that the, the ground gets softer and that the grass goes back to being softer and, and not quite so crunchy under your feet. You can slide down the water slide as many times as you want, or you can uh, be part of the prayer group next to the water slide in lawn chairs, praying that nobody gets hurt as they slide down the water slide. But that will be next Sunday at 1 o'clock following the worship service. Does anybody else have any other announcements that they would like to make this morning? If not, uh, if you would bow your heads with me, and let's continue worshiping in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather to worship. We, we thank you for these facilities. We thank you for air conditioners. We thank you for uh, being able to worship with a, with a certain amount of physical comfort that we might be able to focus solely and completely on you and not be distracted by anything else. We pray that you would help us to leave our, our worries and our anxieties uh, at the door for, for an hour or more and just, just worship you who made us, who created us, who sent your son to die for us, to save us. And Father, we, we pray that you would be with us here and, and, and online as we worship in our homes and that you would bind us together. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would join me, if you want to find Psalm 138, we will continue worshiping by reading God's word together. We'll read Psalm 138. 
You want to find that on your phones or, or tablets uh, or the Pew Bibles. If you're looking on your phone or your tablet, uh, I'm reading from the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, as the translation that I'm reading from this morning. In Psalm 138, we will read all eight verses. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praise before the heavenly beings. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name and for your constant love and truth. You have exalted your name and your promise above everything else. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased strength within me. All the kings of the earth will give you thanks, Lord. When they hear what you have promised, they will sing of the Lord's ways, for the Lord's glory is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he takes note of the humble but he knows the haughty from a distance. If I walk into the thick of danger, you will preserve my life from the anger of my enemies. You will extend your hand. Your right hand will save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Lord, your faithful love endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. We ask that God would bless the reading of his word this morning. And if you are able, our song of adoration is, you are my all in all. If you're able to stand, we'll stand and sing that together.
Now, what is fun about that last song is it's from Revelation chapter 5, and when we get there and read it later, in Revelation chapter 5, it says, the elders around the throne in heaven sing a new song. And for us here at our church, that was a new song. So we've never sung that song before, and it comes from the chapter we're going to study later on. Uh, so sometimes it's just fun when you come to worship, and, and it's just fun. So uh, if you would... Let's continue with the fun, and let's affirm our faith this morning with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. you can be seated. I'll ask the children if they want to come down front this morning for children's time. All right. Good morning. How are you all doing this morning? Good. You're good. Some of you are well vacationed. Right, Zeke? Did you have a good week? All right, very good. Some of you, I know at least uh, two of you, I think, get school gets to start in like a week. How many excited about going back to school? One. One of you are. All right, well, we'll take it. We'll take it. It's a start. I have a, 
That's a very nice marble. You're right. All right. I have a question for you guys. Are you ready? You can take a minute to think about it if you need to. What are some of your favorite, I'm trying to think of the right word, imaginative animals, like from your books or your TV shows? Do you like dragons or do you like unicorns or do you, what are, Pokemon? What are some of your favorite imaginative or fictional or, or magical animals? Do you guys have any, any, anything that you like a lot? Yes, Cole? All right, two puppies and ten stuffed animals. Very good. What about you, Lucy? I saw your hand go up. Dragons. We do like dragons at our house. How to Train Your Dragon. Books about dragons. Stuffed dragons. Ah, there might be a couple of stuffed dragons laying around. Anybody else? Any, any magical, imaginative animals that you like? No? Well, we must be... Weird at our house. We're the only ones that like these fictional, imaginal, imaginative animals. Yes, Cole, do you have another one? I have a best one. You have a best one? Yes. Which one is that? A dog, and its name is Bexy. A dog named Bexy, yes. yes. Your, cousin's, your cousin's dog, I know. All right. Well, what is one thing about dragons, or unicorns, or alicorns, or, I think alicorn is, if I remember correctly, Zeke, and it's been a long time since my My Little Pony days, I think the alicorn is the, uh, a unicorn horn and wings. I think a pegasus is just wings, but no horn, and a unicorn is just a horn, but no wings. Did I get that right? We good? All right, good. All right. One second. What about dragons? What, what, what do we, unicorns and dragons and alicorns and pegasuses, and what are all the Pokemon, what do they all have in common? What's that? You like Pokemon? Oh, Pikmin. You like Pikmin. Okay. What do those all have in common, though? Okay. None of them are real, right? They're all imagined. Now, how many of you have ever seen in one of your shows an animal that looked like this? It's a goat? A spider goat? Ah, oh, that's a good guess. It looks like a goat. <laughs> okay. This is, are you ready? A lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. That's kind of strange, isn't it? It's a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. But you know what the thing about this animal is? This one's real. We're going to read a little later on when we read the book, read chapter 5 in the book of Revelation, that Jesus appears like a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. And then I left out the part of that lamb looking like he had been slaughtered or butchered or killed. Kind of fantastic, isn't it? For all the imaginative things that we come up with, sometimes God's imagination is even even more intense in the way that he inspired John and the visions that he gave John. So just think about that one for a little bit. Seven horns and seven eyes, and there's no children's church today, so, so when we get to the sermon, you can listen to that when we read that in Revelation. All right, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for imaginations. We thank you for fun stories. We thank you for uh, magical creatures that uh, keep us entertained and, and that we like to read the books of dragons and unicorns and, and, and whatever else. But Father, we thank you even more for your imagination, for your book, for your inspired word, and for the true things that we read in it and not just the things that we make up here on earth. Father, we pray that when we read Revelation later on, all of us would learn more about your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go back to your seats this morning.
As we come to our time of prayer this morning, if you would put um, Nicole and Bill Crittenden on your prayer list. I think uh, Nicole has tested positive for COVID. She, she does have some symptoms. I don't know that Bill has tested positive yet or has had... Uh, Bill's, still Bill's still fine? Uh, What's that? Okay. All right. <laughs> so Bill's doing, doing okay. Pray for Nicole. Um, and, and, and they're not kissing, so that's good news for, for Bill uh, at this moment. Uh, but just, yeah, pray that Nicole recovers quickly and, and that Bill doesn't get it. So. Do we have other prayer requests this morning? Well, if not, uh, we will do as we normally do. We will uh, bow our heads and pray silently and individually, and then we will finish together. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we, we lift up Bill and Nicole to you. We especially lift up Nicole as she is, uh, is, 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 is battling through COVID right now, Lord. We, we pray that her symptoms would subside. We pray that they would not get any worse than they are or, or have been and that you would heal her completely. We pray for Bill, Lord, that he would be able to, uh, uh, to, to avoid getting COVID, especially as he's started his new job, and just pray that he would be able to continue on in health and um, take care of his wife, uh, and at the same time, uh, keep himself from getting COVID as well. We, we pray, Lord, for uh, our, our community, our country, uh, this world as this uh, pandemic continues on, um, sometimes in the news, sometimes not in the news, uh, but, Lord, it is still affecting people's lives. And we have schools that are starting. We have colleges that are starting back up. We have a, a, a new school year to start. And just pray, Lord, that you would be watching over each and every one of us. Watch over our neighbors, our friends, our community, our, um, all those that you have created in your image here on this, on this earth. And we pray these things, praying as your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We want to look on the second page of the bulletin this morning. Our offertory thought comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 16. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided to build you a house for your holy name, it is from your hand, and all is yours. And with that thought, I'll ask the ushers to come forward this morning and receive the Lord's offer.
Holy God, we are thankful for this day in which you have set aside for us to worship you. We pray that everything that we do and say will glorify you. Father, thank you for each person and each home that is represented here this morning. We ask for your continued watch care over each of us. We ask now that you would bless this offering. For it is in Christ's name we pray and trust. Amen. Dating game. That's right. It is the, the intro to the dating game from the 50s and the 60s. Good job, Karen. I, if I had a prize, I'd give it to you after the service, but I, I'm sorry. I don't, have a, I don't have a prize. If any of you remember the dating game from way back when, uh, you usually had one eligible bachelorette, and then you had three eligible bachelors, and they were all behind a screen or a partition or something. And then through the course of the show, the the bachelorette would ask questions of the bachelors, and depending on their answers, at the end, she would pick one of them to go on a date with. So if you think about it, reality dating TV shows actually started way back in the 50s and in the 60s. It had been around forever. The, the bachelorette's just, just the dating game on steroids and, <laughs> and other, other things. Uh, we're going to play the savior game this morning. So looking at this week's passage and the things that we have already read, so you, you get to be the, the savior picker. You're the, guys, you don't have to be the bachelorette, but you, you can be the, the, the person seeking a savior, right? We, we all need a savior. So if you think about it, behind door number one, uh, we've got a savior who walks on water. He feeds thousands at a time. He blesses the little children. Uh, that's savior behind door number one. Behind door number two, we have a savior with a golden sash. He has hair as white as your grandfather. He has eyes like flames, feet like bronze, and he has a sharp double-edged sword that, if necessary, could cut you in half if he so chose. And then behind door number three, we have a savior who looks like a butchered lamb, a genetically mutated butchered lamb with seven eyes and with seven horns. And yet, even though he's a lamb, he carries the title, the lion from the tribe of Judah. So which, which one do you pick? Do you pick free lunch savior? Uh, do you pick cut you in half savior? Or do you, do you pick a genetic mutation savior? And does anybody know yet where we're going with this? They are all one and the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Three different ways in which Jesus is, is depicted. Two, two different ways that we have so far in Revelation once we read chapter 5 here in just a minute. But then, of course, the first door number one is, is just Jesus here in his earthly ministry, how we normally think about Jesus, right? We have that picture of him walking on water, of him feeding the 5,000 or the 4,000, depending on which account you are reading and which gospel, uh, him blessing the little children. Uh, that's the way that we normally think about him. We're going to get our second picture of Jesus this morning when we read Revelation that's very different from his earthly ministry. Um, now, as we start reading chapter 5, if you will look right there in verse 1, I want, to, I want us to note this. It says, Then I saw on the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. So we are still in the throne room. If you remember last week in chapter 4, John was called up to the throne room of heaven. He is, he is still there. And he sees God on the throne, and in God's right hand is a scroll, and it's been sealed. And more than one scholar, more than one uh, pastor believes that these are actually the words from chapter 12 in the book of Daniel. So chapter 12 in the book of Daniel, verses 9 and 10, it says this. He said, Go on your way, Daniel, for the words are secret and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified cleansed and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. 
So the thought is, those words that were sealed up at the end of the book of Daniel that he does not get to see, he does not get to tell, he does not get to share, are the words written on this scroll that John sees here in the throne room of Revelation. Or sorry, in the throne room of heaven in Revelation chapter 5. So let's, let's read chapter 5 together, and then we'll go through it. We'll work through it. And John writes this. Then I saw on the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look, at it, even to look in it. I wept and wept because there was no one found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you are slaughtered, and you purchased a people for God by your blood from every tribe and language with pe and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands, plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So as we get started, these are the words from the book of Daniel. And when Daniel receives his vision and his words, and he records them and he writes them down, and then chapter 12, of those, the verses 9 and 10, when God says, seal up these last set of words until the time of the end, and if that's the scroll that God has in heaven in his right hand here at the beginning of Revelation chapter 5, that means that when those are unsealed, that the time of the end begins, which means that John and the churches that he is writing to Start the end times, if you want to put it that way. Uh, we're not looking for the end times. We're living in the end times and have been since the New Testament era church. That would be my understanding. That would be my take. Uh, and so here is John. They're getting ready to unseal these words or the, unseal the scroll. He wants to know what's in them. Wouldn't you want to know what in, what's in them? Um, but he's distraught because they can't find anybody. If you look there in verse 3, no one in heaven, or, in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look in it. There's seven seals and they can't find anybody to break those seven seals. And if, you, if you're ever wondering, why seven? There are three words in the Bible that represent completion. And particularly here in Revelation. The numbers 3, 7, and 12. So anytime you see the numbers 3, 7, and 12 in the Bible, don't think that you have to find three things, or seven things, or 12 things. They are, they are numbers that, si that symbolize, that represent completion. So if there are seven seals on this scroll, then what we're going to read about when we get to chapter 6 is that this is God's complete judgment against sin and evil and wickedness. And this is going to happen at least three times in the book of Revelation. We have seven seals. We're going to see seven trumpets. We're going to see seven bowls of wrath. But don't think that you have to get out your calendars and your timelines and say, okay, uh, event number one in 323 A.D. Event number two, it, it's, it's completeness. It's completion. It's not necessarily seven specific events. But before they get there, before they can 
break these seals, they have to find somebody worthy to, to undo the seals. And they can't. And John weeps. And you look there in verse 4. He says, I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. Hey, think about it. Whether you're in elementary school or in high school or, or whether you're an adult, when somebody comes up to you and says, I have a secret, what's the first thing that you say? Oh, well, if you have a secret, you might want to keep that secret to yourself. You should probably protect yourself. You might not want to let anybody know what your secret is. Or if they say, you know what? Our neighbor told me a secret. Oh, well, if your neighbor told you a secret and they entrusted you with something and you're helping, to bear, helping them bear a burden that's hard for them to bear, uh, you don't want to break that trust. You should probably keep that secret to yourself. What's the first thing you say when somebody tells you they have a secret? What is it, right? You want to know, what is it? What's the secret? I want to know what the secret is. I want to be on the end. What's, what's the secret? Let me know, let me know. How many of you ever pestered somebody who told you they had a secret until they finally gave in and told you what the secret was? Anybody? Any a few? Some of you, yeah, all right. Most of us are honest this morning. We want to know what the secret is. Well, this is more than just a secret. Right? This is more than just finding out in third grade that Joey has cooties. This is, these are secrets that God has to the, to the culmination of human history. There are events that are sealed up in this scroll, and John wants to know what they are, and they can't find anyone, and he is, he is crying, he is weeping. And one of the 24 elders... You look there in verse 5, he comes up and he says to John, Do not weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And this is, this is prophecy. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Then a shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse. That, that's David's dad, the stump of Jesse. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. You go back to Genesis when Jacob is giving blessings to his son before, sons before he dies. And his son Judah, he says of Judah, Judah is a young lion. My son, you return from the kill. He crouches, he lies down like a lion or a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah. That's, that's what kings ruled with, right? They had a scepter. And they ruled it was symbolic of their authority and of their power. The scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until he whose right it is comes and the obedience of all the peoples belongs to him. So here is Jesus, says the elder. This, this shoot from the stump of Jesse, this, this lion from the tribe of Judah, he can open up the seven seals. He can open up the scroll. Now, if you remember, when we started studying Revelation, one of the things we said was the word means revealing. Right? God wants us to understand what is written in the book. He gives John this vision so that we might know what is happening, what has happened, and what is going to happen. And so if John, if John had, known then, had known then what we know now, he would, he would know that God is about to reveal what is in the scrolls. Because that's, that's the whole point of the vision. That's the whole point of the book, is to reveal what is going to happen. And so in our, our second section this morning, it's short, it's just verses 6 and 7. And this is, this is our second picture of Jesus. Remember, our first full picture of Jesus came from chapter 1. And John said, I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like a son of man, dressed in a robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair of his head was as white as wool, white as snow. And his flames like a fiery, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze, and it's fired as it is fired in a furnace. And his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp, double-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was shining like that of the, at full strength. The second picture of Jesus is so different from that first one. In verses 6 and 7, Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, 
which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth, he went and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. If you're wondering why seven horns, so we've already mentioned that seven is a number of completeness. Anytime you read seven in the Bible, you can, you can not always, but, but a lot of times you can make a pretty good assumption that whatever it's talking about is complete and total and final. Uh, horns represented strength and power and authority. So here is the Lamb of God with seven horns, and it's not some weird scientific experiment that gave this lamb seven horns. John is saying he saw the Son of Man, he saw Jesus as a lamb slaughtered because he was crucified and he was nailed to that cross. And he has seven horns. He has complete power and authority and strength to open those seals and to do what he's going to do. And he has seven eyes. The eyes, they represent the Spirit of God. It says it right there. Seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. With the Holy Spirit right here in these verses. The Spirit of God sent into all the earth. Again, seven, complete, total. God is everywhere all at once. And Jesus goes up and he takes the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. We have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit here in these two verses. And he is worthy to open the scroll and to break the seals. This picture of a slaughtered lamb. Now think about it for a minute. That's so unhuman, inhuman. I don't know how you want to put it. It's so otherworldly. It's unworldly. When, when, a, when a nation in our time and day, when a country wants to show their strength and they want to intimidate another country, what do they do? All right, they... They, 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 they have naval exercises as close to the shoreline of that country as they can possibly get. They launch missiles. They fly planes. Uh, they may just invade. They may roll their tanks across the border and start demolishing buildings and houses and, and cities. We, we show strength by showing strength. Exercising that strength and flexing those muscles and saying, listen, uh, if you oppose what it is that we want to do, little country... You're not going to be around a whole lot longer. We have authority. We have power. We have strength. That's not what God chooses to do. That's not what Jesus chose to do. He went to the cross instead. In fact, the night when Jesus was arrested, do you remember one of his disciples? We know it's Peter. Pulled out a sword and he cut off the, the, the servant of the high priest's ear. And Jesus said to Peter, he said, put your sword back in its place. Because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think, uh, this, is, this is probably one of the best rhetorical questions in the Bible. Or do you think that I cannot call on my Father and he will provide me here and now with more than 12 legions of angels? Peter, I could show strength. One prayer to the Father and we had 12 legions of angels that are going to come down and they're going to wipe out this planet in an instant. But that's not what this is about, Peter. There's not going to be any blood shed for me to give my kingdom other than my own, essentially is what Jesus said. And so here he is, the slaughtered lamb in heaven with the authority and the power and the strength to break those seven seals. Now, it just occurred to me this week in going through chapter 5 that it's almost identical to chapter 4. If you were here last week, if you're able to be here, if you remember when we went through chapter 4, it divided really nicely into two halves. The first half was John describing the throne room of heaven. He sees the one seated on the throne, and we get this, this description of Jasper and Carnelian and of, and of a rainbow around the throne that looked like an emerald. And then the second half of chapter 4 is the response of the four strange living creatures and the elders, and they worship God in the throne room of heaven. Here in chapter 5, the first half, verses 1 through 7, we have this description of Jesus the Savior, the slaughtered lamb who has authority to open up the seals. And then the second half, just like chapter 4, is all about worshiping the lamb. It's a response, again, it's a response of worship. Description, then worship. Chapter 4, chapter 5, description, and then worship. And that's what's going to happen. Jesus takes the scroll, and it says there in verse 8, when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and a golden bowl filled with incense, 
which, is, which are the prayers of the saints. Now just pause for a moment. As they worship the Lamb, these 24 elders fall down and worship, and they have these golden bowls filled with incense, which are our prayers. Did you know that you were a saint? Did you know that when you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and as, as Lord and Savior to save you from your sins, that you, you were given sainthood in God's kingdom? Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verse 19, So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. It's kind of a humbling thought, isn't it? Whether here in church or at home, when you pray, your prayers go up to the throne room of heaven in the form of this incense that these 24 elders pour out before the throne. makes you wonder about what you pray for. Well, God, we've got, we have children who are starving to death. And Sharon's been praying about those children who don't have enough food to eat. We've got people who are suffering from cancer. And Joe's been praying for those who are suffering and dying from cancer. He would like you to heal them. And Mike Birch has been praying. His birthday's coming up. He'd like you to know what he wants for his birthday. What do you want going up to the throne room of heaven when you pray? And it's okay to ask for things, but we should probably ask for good things because they're there. We say that every now and then when we start our prayer time. Let's go before the throne because our prayers go up to the throne room in heaven. And these 24 elders present those prayers before God and then they worship. Actually, before the Lamb. They're before the Lamb at this point. They pour out the prayers, our prayers, and then they sing a new song. They say, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom of priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. And then the angels respond. You, you love the scene of worship. Here's Jesus, takes the scrolls, the elders respond, they fall down, they worship. The angels around the throne room of heaven, they see what's going on. They hear the worship. In verse 11, John says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also the living creatures and the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. Now, let's not get all modern here for a minute. This is an infinite number of angels. The Greek that the New Testament was written in, the Hebrew that the Old Testament was written in, the highest word that they had when it came to counting was thousand. They didn't have millions, they didn't have billions, they didn't have word for trillions. So John is not saying that there's only 999,999 angels and then it stops because it was any more, we get to a million. It's, it's, he says, no, we can't, have, we can't have millions of angels. It's, the highest number is thousand. That's why it says that there were countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. So there's an infinite number of angels around the throne. And when they hear the elders worship, they respond in worship. And the angels say, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And that makes a whole lot of sense. I think this is the, these are the same angels that announced Jesus' birth. Remember with the shepherds out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night? And the angels show up and say, by the way, in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you. And then a multitude of the heavenly hosts show up and they are praising God and giving him glory in the highest. These same angels now respond to that same Savior up in the throne room of heaven, saying, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. And then it goes on, the elders and then the angels and then the animals. Verse 13, I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. What an incredible scene. I mean, what it, I love it when we have good worship here in the sanctuary. Those, I think those angels, they would roll us right out the door if they were here. 
If you think heaven is sitting on fluffy clouds and you're going to be plucking that little harp and it's going to be nice and quiet and peaceful and, and meditative, that's, that's the exact opposite of what's going on. This, this is probably about as loud as it can be. And thank the Lord we will have resurrected ears because I'm not sure if anybody is to be, would, would have any hearing left after witnessing this worship scene in the throne room of heaven. And they say, did you notice they say the same things about God the Father and God the Son? If you look back in chapter 4, which we covered last week, the four living creatures, or the, the, the elders, they said, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And here in chapter 5, they say to the Son, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing power, honor, and glory both to the Father and to the Son. And then they put them together in verse 13 of our passage. Blessing and honor and glory and power to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And then everybody worships. And the four living creatures said, Amen. Well, what do we do with this? Chapter 5 in the book of Revelation this morning. That's always the challenge. That's, that's always, the, that's always the, most, the hardest, most difficult part of studying the Bible. It, it really is. We generally do a pretty good job of, of, of figuring out what it means. Whether we're in the Gospels or whether we're in the Old Testament or the book of Revelation, or whether it's Sunday morning during the sermon or at a Bible study or in Sunday school, we can look at a passage, we can read it, we say, okay, it, mean, it means this. Right? Jesus, Jesus cares for the lowly. We should care for the lowly. That's, that's what it means. We get that. It's usually pretty deep. Oh, we, we can debate and argue about the finer points until Jesus comes back, but, but we generally get the, the gist of a passage. We generally get the main point. And then sometimes say, okay, well, that's what it means, so now what do we believe? Now that we know what a passage means, what do we believe about God the Father in heaven, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? And we can... We, we can come up, we, we've got a pretty good set of beliefs and doctrines. We, this is what the Bible says about God and who he is and what he has done. Then the hard part is, well, how do we live life in response? We, we like the term life application. It really shouldn't be life application. It should be life transformation. Right? You apply a Band-Aid to a little cut. When we study the Bible, we don't just want to apply something to life to, to cover up a problem. We, we want to be changed from the inside out. How do we live? How do we interact? How do we relate to people in our families, people at work, people in our church, our children, our parents, our brothers and our sisters, based on what we just read? And what do we do with a passage like this? A, we should worship. We should definitely follow the example set by the elders and the angels and the animals, the creatures in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and the four strange living creatures. We should certainly worship, but what else? And I think this week it's a mindset. I think this week it's an understanding that what made Jesus worthy to break those seals is the fact that he had suffered and died first. Because every one of those seven seals, when they are opened, when we get to Revelation chapter 6 in a couple of weeks, none of them is pleasant. There is not one thing that happens when these seals are broken that doesn't include suffering and death and division and conflict and strife and tension. None of it. It's all, <laughs> it's all bad. But Jesus suffered and died first. And I think that's a mindset that we have to have. Because sometimes we look at what goes on in the world and people will say things, they'll ask us questions, or we might even ask ourselves, how could a good God let such bad things happen? And our response is usually something like, well, you know, we, we make our own mistakes. It's our own fault. We mess things up. We sin. We, we fall short. We've done this. We've done that. And, and that is true. But when these seven seals are broken, and famine is unleashed, and war is unleashed, and plagues are unleashed, and everything else that we will read about in chapter 6, these are 
These are God-prophesied, God-ordained, God-initiated disasters. And we can't always say, well, it's our own fault. There, there are times when there is war on this earth, and that's what God wants. But to keep in mind that Jesus suffered and died first. He died to save us from the terrible things that are coming first. He died to save your neighbor from the terrible things that are coming first. And then he opened the seals. And it's the same message today. That it's God ordained. God is sovereign over everything that is happening, whether it's when John was alive and received this vision or here in 2022. No matter how bad this world gets, remember that Jesus suffered on the cross to save us first. If you'd bow your heads with me, let's finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for this vision. We thank you for this chapter in the book of Revelation to know and to understand that no matter what is happening on this earth, and how bad it gets, and we know that it's bad, all we have to do is turn on the news or, or open up our phones and, and look at a news app, and we see nothing but, but evil. Help us to understand that you, that you must punish evil. To understand that you, must, that you must bring judgment and you must eradicate sin. And help us to always remember that your son, you sent your son to die for us first. To save us, our children, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors. This message is available to anyone. That you redeem us from evil, you redeem us from sin, you purchase us back for yourself, and ultimately, your desire is to redeem us from an eternity in hell. Help us to live with that mindset, to share the message, to, to look at the world and never despair, to know that you are in control, and that your ultimate desire is to save. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would stand, if you are able, our song of invitation this morning is Open the Eyes of My Heart. And we'll stand and we will sing that together.
And for you to receive the benediction this morning, at the end of Revelation, John writes, See who testified, testifies about these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. Thank you.